Now, for the past 60 years, the everyday life of the Archers here on BBC Radio 4 has been by turns enthralling, delighting, amusing and sometimes annoying the programme's millions of loyal listeners. But in all that time, there's one facet of village life in Ambridge which has gone largely unremarked. In the first of two programmes, the author Michael Dobbs sets out to explore the politics of Ambridge. This is quite an occasion. It's 60 years to the day since the Archers first burst upon the scene, and even if you're not a regular listener, and shame on you, you'll probably be familiar with some of the highlights. It's had everything. Sudden deaths, unwanted births, car smashes, kidnappings, sex in the shower, and more than a few fumblings in the forest. But it's also had a serious side, and for the next two programmes, we'll be having a gentle tramp across the landscape of Ambridge politics during the past six decades. What? Politics? Amongst those nice folk of Ambridge? At some point, Neil said it ought to be called the Grundies versus their oppressors. The campaign gives me the opportunity to raise vital issues of policy. (laughs) With Joe Grundy? Dan Archer here, it tells you a bit about him, and it says, Religion, Church of England, Politics, Conservative. Doris Archer, Religion, Church of England, Politics, Conservative. Susan Carter... I have no alternative but to send you to prison for six months. What? Take her down. You're sending me to prison? Someone asked me what I thought, and I said that I thought she shouldn't have been sent to prison. I think you were Home Secretary at the time. You you publicly intervened. I was (laughs) Home Secretary at the time, yes. When it came to our trial, the judge did say to the jury, this is not the archers. Yes, politics has been in the bloodstream of the Archers from the very beginning. And it's drawn some very big political fans. I think I must have been one of the early listeners because I was four years old. I remember vividly my mum dancing round the small living room to the Archers signature tune. And I don't remember anything about those early episodes, but I've been hooked ever since. I've got so many friends. When I've had young women working for me and so on, I mean, I've, I've, I love it when they say they're Archers fans because then we've got something to talk about. I say, my God, what about what happened last night? I always regarded Phil Archer as my role model and uh, I've had the greatest respect both for Phil in the Archers and Norman Painting who played him, whose death we all mourned and um, I went along to, to Norman's memorial service. So did John Major. The voices there are three well-known political figures, Baroness Kinnock and two former Home Secretaries, David Blunkett and Michael, now Lord Howard. And banging the political drum hasn't been an accident. Here's Vanessa Whitburn, who's been the editor of The Archers for the past 20 years. I know we're in Hansard, and I know some politicians follow us or their wives or husbands or whatever. I think it's... In genuinely, it's influential in the way that I would hope good drama can be, in that it asks questions and it mirrors our society. At its best, it mirrors our society back to us and therefore implicitly questions things. For the next half hour, we'll be looking at how the Archers has dealt with politics over the years and the friction it's caused with politicians as a result. None of us can escape the shadow of politics, no matter how much at times we'd like to. And from its earliest days, the Archers has sought to reflect the sometimes painful realities. Here's a clip from 1952. Hey, hey up, Phil. It's gone six. Switch on the news. Oh, good gracious, yes. See what Mr Butler's Mm. done for us, or or to us. (laughs) Well, whatever he says, I've got a feeling it's not going to be very pleasant, Dan. (laughs) He's got a devil of a lot of money to get from somewhere, but he'd have a bit of a job to get it from me at the moment, as my bank manager would very soon tell him. (laughs) (laughs) I'll bet your cigarettes go up. An income tax. The Exchequer has proposed in his budget statement cuts in the food subsidies and concessions in income tax, family allowances and pension. A little bother at Brookfield there. In one sense, the Archers owes its very existence to the politics of post-war austerity. Those were the years of food rationing, and the Archers' creator, Godfrey Baisley, conceived his programme as providing an entertaining way of packaging advice to farmers on how best to grow more food. Some saw it as propaganda straight from the Ministry of Agriculture, and the Ministry often provided considerable chunks of the script. But it wasn't just that. Godfrey Baisley, the man known simply as God by the cast, seems to have had a clear political vision for his newly created village. Here's one of God's successors as editor, William Smithurst. 
Well, here we've got the original continuity cards, which were started in 1951. This was all done by Godfrey Baisley, who invented the whole thing, all the characters, and he decided on everything about them. So we've got Dan Archer here. It tells you a bit about him, and it says, Religion, Church of England, Politics, Conservative. Doris Archer, Religion, Church of England, Politics, Conservative. Philip Archer, Religion, Church of England, Politics, Conservative, Inclined to the Left. <laughs> so they all had a, a political background. All the characters were given a, a political background by the original uh, editor. Well, the important ones were, yes. Even old Walter Gabriel was the sort of old codger of the village. Politics, Conservative, Religion, Church of England. <laughs> was there anybody there who didn't have Conservative as a, being their underlying politics? No. As far as the, the records are concerned, anybody who was mentioned, the politics were mentioned, are uh, down as being a Conservative. Baisley scripted his characters with meticulous care. Nothing was left to chance, not who they were, what they did, or what they were supposed to think. June Spencer, the original Peggy, is the sole remaining member of the cast that took to the airwaves 60 years ago today. Well, we each were given a sort of a biography of the characters, and in fact, Godfrey interviewed each of us in character right at the beginning. We were given pretty good background. I knew that I came from the east end of London, Mrs Perkins was my mother, that I'd been in the ATS during the war and that was where I met Jack Archer and that Peggy was brought in as a town character and as country ways were explained to her, it also explained it to the listeners from the towns and cities. But was this part of an insidious political plot? God's attempt to create Ambridge in his own political image? No, absolutely nothing at all about politics of any of us. I don't know whether the subject was taboo in those days, but no, there was nothing, no. Perhaps the conservatism of the countryside at the time was simply taken for granted. But at its peak, in the mid-1950s, the Archers had 20 million listeners. It was potentially a hugely powerful propaganda tool. And even if the cast was unaware, some listeners were beginning to detect a distinctly political edge to the programme. Among them, a young lad from Sheffield, David Blunkett. It was a bit sharp in class terms, not so much the town versus the country, because I found the countryside fascinating and the Tom Forrest reflections on Sunday morning of what was changing in the countryside and learning a little bit more about nature. But the Grundys versus the Archers, the class that came through in that was both reflective of politics at the time and, if you like, a little bit sharpening of your political spurs. You know, you could get moderately, I mean, because the Archers has always been moderately, moderately angry about what someone was doing to someone else. In the Commons, Labour MPs grew angry, especially when members of the cast were invited to open Conservative Party fates. Actress June Spencer explains. There was very little television then, and uh, we were the um, stars that they wanted at fates and openings and that sort of thing. I have vague feelings that I once went to a conservative one, but we didn't think anything of it at the time until we were forbidden to do it. I believe that questions were asked in Parliament. I think the Socialist members were a bit up in arms because we seemed to favour the Conservatives. And so uh, it was decreed that uh, there should be no more public appearances at uh, political fates. Anger in Parliament and anger behind the scenes too. Some believe that internal politics in those early days played a key role in one of the most dramatic and memorable moments in any British soap. What's up? Midnight couldn't have been tied and look, she's going back into the stable. What? what? No, Grace! No, don't do it! She's going in after midnight. Grace! Grace! Grace, come back! The roof's collapsing! For God's sake, Grace, come back! Look at that roof! The death of Grace Archer in the arms of her husband, Phil, after a fire at the stables in 1955, caused queues at Dr. Surgery's with listeners complaining of depression. It also very successfully eclipsed the opening night of ITV, and some thought that was deliberate. But William Smethurst believes there may have been another, much more political reason for why his Anne Churchman, the actress who played Grace, was written out of the programme. I went to see Godfrey Baisley um, when I was writing one of the books I wrote about the Archers, not long before he died, actually, and I asked him the true reason. I said, was it because ITV opened? And he said to me, no, it wasn't. It was because it, Zen Churchman, the actress, was trying to make the other actors join equity. I didn't want them to be in a union. So we killed her off. 
and it was just coincidence it happened on the night ITV opened. Two years later, the actress Paddy Green joined the cast as Jill, the woman destined to become Phil Archer's second wife, and she told me something about Isan Churchman's departure that, frankly, shocked me. The story that I had, and this is a deep secret, was that she asked for more money, and Godfrey Baisley said no, because she was equity deb, and she slapped his face. Well, that is r real sort of picket line stuff on the archers, but at least immediately behind the, the microphones of the archers. Yes, uh, Philip Archer told me, so I'm imagining it was probably true. Despite this outburst of political passion, in later years, Isan Churchman returned to the archers to play several roles, among them the tenant farmer, Mary Pound. But by then, the programme was steering towards considerably choppier political waters. The BBC and Godfrey Baisley parted company in 1972, and the programme was in danger of being axed. But the newly appointed head of the BBC's Midland region, Jock Gallagher, was keen to revive its fortunes. He wanted to explore current affairs by showing their effect on the lives of Ambridge residents. So when, the following year, Britain joined the common market and the world of British farmers was about to change beyond recognition, it seemed an opportunity too good to miss. We switched on to current affairs and the influence of the outside world on the programme. And when we entered the common market, as it was then called, we came up with this wheeze of actually taking a busload of the archers, cast and writers to Amsterdam to witness the, the common market at first hand. And we published a special edition of the Borchester Echo to commemorate our entry into the common market. For five days, listeners followed the progress of a coachload of Ambridge folk around the best that Dutch agriculture had to offer. It seemed they had landed in paradise. Well, a fella said it's to show ordinary non-farming people just what Dutch farming's all about. Well, they certainly succeed there. And they opened my eyes, too. Those controlled glasshouses, you mean? I thought yours were pretty special, Mrs. Tregaren. Yes, but did you see the quality of what they were producing? Those lettuces, yeah. They looked so perfect. I could have sworn they were made of plastic. And did you notice how cool it was where those roses were being grown? Yes, well, deliberately retarding the budding until market prices were high. Ah. After he left the BBC, Jock Gallagher stood as a Liberal Democrat for the Westminster and European Parliaments. And looking back on that outing to Amsterdam, he admits it was all politically rather naive. We reaped the harvest of complaints from quite a wide source of anti-common market people. They were complaining that we were using the archers to propagate the cause of the common markets. Well, we did, uh, yes, unashamedly. But again, we were doing it in the interest of what was happening within the countryside at that time. The common agricultural policy seemed to be a good thing for British agriculture and so on. So, uh, yes, I admit, we fell into that trap of being highly political inadvertently. But the programme couldn't simply ignore the common market. So how should the archers have dealt with such a contentious issue? The programme's current editor, Vanessa Whitburn. As long as you debate all aspects of the issue, you can do it. The difficulty is if you just take one line. I mean, one of the reasons why, for example, I would be a bit uncomfortable, I think, with doing something like having, I believe, Mark Hebden was an SDP candidate, wasn't he? At a time when the SDP were the new kids on the block. So you could argue that actually what they were doing was sociologically quite interesting because they were the kind of maverick upper middle classes that were coming up and saying, no, we're not going to be a Tory or we're not going to be Labour, we're doing something different or we're doing something new. But... It's tricky because at the same time as that, Shirley Williams and co was saying, you know, vote for us, we're a new party. And you could argue that having Mark there was a kind of enormous ad for the party. So I would tend to avoid it myself. I would tend to say, let's debate issues through character. A quarter of a century later, the programme headed into another almighty political storm, genetically modified crops. Tom Archer, the son of organic farmers Tony and Pat, hated GM crops and in 1999 he destroyed a trial crop in a field belonging to his uncle, Brian Aldridge. The script was written by Graham Harvey, the Archer's agricultural story editor. Brian was growing a trial crop of GM-manipulated oilseed rape 
And we knew from the outset this was going to be highly controversial, and we actually had to make sure it was balanced, even to the point of measuring to the second both sides of the argument. In fact, as you'll remember, we followed the trial. Tom was charged with criminal damage and subsequently went to trial. We kept returning to the trial over a whole week. There's something we're forgetting here, celebrating this great public hero. This guy put on a balaclava and went out at night so he wouldn't get seen. I do have a problem with that. So he didn't want to get into all this hassle and who can blame him? No, there's a point here. The prosecution made it very strongly. If he genuinely believed what he was doing was right, would he need to be that furtive? Of course he wouldn't. He might, though. Just because he um, did hide his identity, we can't necessarily conclude it wasn't a genuine act. I can. Anyway, what about the violence? It wasn't him, Terry. We've already established that. He was part of it, though. They were all in it together. Come on, there was a bit of a fracker and someone threw a punch. Big deal. It was only a black eye. Well, it's easy to say that, but a violent act against you can change your life. It doesn't have to land you in hospital. Happened to my wife. We actually measured the length of speeches in court in favour of GM with those opposed to GM. So because it was so controversial, we knew we had to be absolutely even-handed about it, and we were, until it came to the verdict, and then he was found not guilty, of course. Yes, not guilty, of course. But the issue became even more controversial when, just three months after Tom's arrest, 28 Greenpeace activists, amongst them the Labour peer Lord Melchett, were arrested while destroying a real-life experimental GM crop in Norfolk. Like the fictional Tom Archer, Peter Melchett recalls that they too were charged with criminal damage and their case sent for trial. We were arrested after Tom had been arrested, but before he went on trial. And I think the BBC then became concerned that if they played out the script as they'd written it, which was that Tom would be acquitted, this might be seen as influencing the jury in our trial, which was some months away then. And I've heard from somebody who was a member of the governors of the BBC at the time that there was a discussion at that level about whether they should change the script. It was seriously suggested that they should change the script to avoid influencing the jury. Well, how they were going to do that, because one way or another... They were going to influence the jury if they did at all in favour or against us. Except that life does imitate art and people do confuse the two. Yes, they do. And when it came to our trial, the judge did say to the jury, this is not the archers. For the record, the real trial, like its fictional counterpart, ended in acquittal. But this wasn't the first time a legal case in the imaginary world of the archers had proved controversial in the real world of politics. We're back in court in 1993, and Susan Carter is about to be sentenced for aiding and abetting her brother Clive, an armed robber on the run. Susan Carter, I have no alternative but to send you to prison for six months. What? Take her down. Oh, you're sending me to prison? Mrs Carter, you may go down. They're not taking her straight to prison, man. I don't believe it. Susan! Susan, don't worry. It'll be all right. We'll get you out. It'll be all right, I promise. When we sent Susan Carter to prison for supporting her brother, who was treating her very unkindly to get that support, we sent her to prison over Christmas and she had young children. There was an eruption in the real world about whether this woman would have been sent to prison and the wonderful thing was judges argued, barristers argued, solicitors argued. That's drama at its best. I love it when it ripples out into the real world. Well, as regular listeners will know, Susan was sent to prison for an offence which I actually thought in real life she probably would not have been sent to prison for. Michael Howard was a leading cabinet minister. That didn't stop him joining the debate. And then there was a great campaign to release her and uh, someone asked me what I thought and I said roughly what I've just said, which is that I thought she shouldn't have been sent to prison. I think you were Home Secretary at the time. I, you, you publicly I was, I was <laughs> Home Secretary at the time, yes. I did. Hmm, bit of a problem, surely. In theory, the Home Secretary had the power to pardon Susan. Did Vanessa Whitburn feel at all lent on by Michael Howard's intervention? He wasn't leaning on us. He had a point of view. I mean, the Daily Mail was leaning on us, incredibly. I mean, I think they produced a little thing that people had to fill in and send to me, Vanessa. I mean, it was obviously inundated with these bits of paper. It's part of the fun. Leaning on me would be making a private phone call and saying something, and he didn't do that. It's fine to give your opinion. That's exciting. And, of course, plenty of other politicians have expressed opinions about the Archers, some directly to the BBC. 
In the late 1970s and early 80s, a campaign got underway in Ambridge to save Borchester Grammar School. And when 11-year-old Lucy Perks passed her 11 plus and was offered a place, her parents, Sid and Polly, couldn't contain their delight. But regular listeners Glennis and Neil Kiddock were considerably less delighted. And as Glennis recalls, Neil was moved to put pen to paper. I think Neil was shadow education when Callaghan was there. And I think I did press him to do this because of the influence of the archers. And of course on education now you do see a much, much more uh, liberal view and not all of them are, are, are rushing off to the grammar school or posh universities even. You know, you do see much more willingness now to, uh, apart from Brian Aldridge of course who resists all progress of any kind. That's not in his interest anyway. And so I think I, I might have been behind that letter writing of Neil's. Dear old Brian, always good for a bit of political kicking, as we'll see again in a minute. But school's policy was one of the hottest of political potatoes. William Smethurst was the Archer's editor at the time. First of all, Neil Kinnock, in fact, had written to me a very nice letter, very long one, very detailed, saying, please, can you consider, you know, comprehensive education, this, that and the other, but I, I still like the programme. Actually, it was his wife who liked it more than him, I think. <laughs> but he wrote first and we took no notice and sent him a nice reply, I'm sure. So the next thing was that the heavyweights came in and we did get the call for Director General. We didn't take any notice then and nobody minded, nothing happened. I think the Director General accused yeah. you of running blatant Tory educational propaganda. Yes. <laughs> well, was I doing that? I wonder. There was a time in the late 70s, we'd got Shula Archer in. I, I was very conscious of my desire to genuinely show the life of the English shires. Now, you can say that the local grammar school, that is just as much an issue for the city. But it was a big issue at the time, and we did have the couple in the village, the Perkses, who's an 11-year-old girl who got, would get, get into grammar school. Great chance for her, they were so proud. But then these people say, no, no, she's got to go to comprehensive. And Shula Archer, our great heroine, the character who saved the programme, really, in that time, by emerging as this uh, very sexy 18-year-old radical Thatcherite figure and suddenly the archers became very fashionable and because of Shul, there's no doubt about it, she naturally wanted to support her grammar school and she led this campaign. Shula, the saviour of the archers, a radical Thatcherite? Well, she did join the young Conservatives, but Judy Bennett, the actress who still plays the character, remembers Shula's motivation as not being quite so black and white or Tory blue. The word young <laughs> tells you everything. I think she was just very interested, probably, in somebody involved in the young Conservatives. She, being a horse rider and somebody who went hunting, she would be very interested from that point of view because she knew that they were pro-hunting. And I don't know that it was that political. It was probably a more social thing, like the young farmers, because she, I think she was involved in the young farmers as well. And she was quite a social animal when she was a young girl. But if William Smethurst had made Schuler a fragrant and somewhat flagrant right-winger, there was always a counterweight in the form of radical feminist Pat Archer. Here's Pat Gallimore, the actress who plays the character. Particularly at the time in the 80s when she was very keen to express her feminist views and change the family newspaper from the Express to the Guardian and took a keen interest in, well, she was a member of CND and even went to Greenham Common. She did a women's studies course at Borchester Tech. I do remember that when, you know, one turned up at events and things, people were sort of saying, oh, well, you, you, you're, you're the left-wing one and things like that. So, I mean, obviously it was remarked upon, I mean, which was nice because it made the character stick out a bit and, you know, people take notice, so I quite like that. But others didn't like it. The new editor, Liz Rigby, who replaced William Smethurst in 1986, feared Pat was rapidly turning from character into caricature. What I did stop was something that the previous editor had done, which was turn Pat into a complete laughing stock because she was a feminist and CND and all her ridiculous, you know, knit your own yoghurt and, oh, you know, she was just regarded as something ludicrous because of her views. And, uh, no, that had to go when I came. It had to go. <laughs> we'll hear more from Liz Rigby next week as we look at the pressures faced by editors trying to reflect the social changes in the countryside. But, for now, a final question for a couple of the programme's heavyweight political followers. 
Suppose David Blunkett and Michael Howard were canvassing the village at election time. At whose door would they expect to find a warm welcome? I think that's a really hard question. I think um, the vicar would be a Liberal Democrat. Probably Pat. She'd have a really good argument with Tony at home about that. Possibly the Grundys, although in my experience of canvassing, the Grundys wouldn't vote at all. And uh, then they grumble like mad about whoever got elected. But that's the way of the world. Well, I'd like to think that it would have been Phil's, but of course he's not there anymore. I hope that I'd still sort of be welcome if I knocked at, at Jill's door. Do you think you'd get a torrid welcome in any corner? I've no doubt. There are f- quite a few corners where I'd get a torrid welcome, <laughs> I dare say. <laughs> The fact is, canvassing in Ambridge can be a dangerous enterprise. The campaign gives me the opportunity to raise vital issues of policy. (laughs) With Joe Grundy? Charles Collingwood remembers his character, Brian Aldridge, on the campaign trail in 1989. And as we've said, Brian was always in for a bit of political kicking, even from the cows. It suddenly dawned on the writers it'd be quite fun if they made him stand as the Conservative councillor for the local elections. And uh, I thought, as an actor, this was quite fun. I thought it was quite fun, too, when the scene was that he went to the Grundys to try and get their vote, which is actually mildly stupid when you think that he was standing as a Tory and they were unlikely to vote for him. It all went a bit haywire because he got knocked over by one of the Grundys' BSE-ridden cows for his pains and his head was split open on the cowshed floor and he was on a life support machine for a couple of weeks, so that taught him a lesson. Joe, what are you doing? I'll see what she does if you make a noise. No, I don't think that's a very good idea, Joe. Joe, you fool, look, get out of the way. Watch her head, Joe. Oh, my God, Joe. Get out of the way. She'll have you against that wall. Now, back, back. Oh. oh, my God, Mr. Aldrich. A cow, Clary, a cow, a cow. No, 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 she's gone, it's all right. Mr. Aldrich? Mr. Aldrich? Thankfully, Brian recovered from his political mauling to lift our spirits with many more years of plotting, intrigue and scandal. The script never openly declared he was a Conservative, of course, or that Joe Grundy's cow was some sort of radical feminist, We got the picture anyway. Vanessa Whitburn. Whereas in the old days you would pretty accurately say that a character that came from a certain walk of life would be bound to vote in a certain way. Nowadays, I think I would enjoy the debate about whether a character that did accumulation of things equal the fact that they would vote in a certain way. It's not our job in the programme anymore, I think, to say, Pat is definitely a socialist, or Brian is definitely a conservative, because I think party politics is much finer grained than that, and people vote in very, very different ways. Let the listener decide. Politics has come a long way over the past 60 years, and so has the archers. No prizes for guessing who remains the most popular, though. Next week, more changes in the countryside and how the archers handle the really big social issues like racism and fox hunting. Till then, Happy New Year. Weekend. Good morning. The Archers is 60 years old. It's the longest running soap anywhere in the world. And over the years, it's got involved in all sorts of political battles, even elections. We didn't see you at church this morning. No, I've been busy beating the campaign trail and I think I've got some policies you'll be interested in. Oh, right. Now, as you know, affordable housing has long been a concern of I'm mine. I'm just going to go yeah, back, I love oh, But, Emma, it's young people such as yourself who are bearing the brunt of inflated prices. I know, but, well, it is quite cold. Linda Snell trying to press the flesh and getting left out in the cold as real politicians know only too well. Well, then maybe I could... Uh, uh, sorry, um... Ed's still asleep. Oh, well, then perhaps we could all go over to the house, Susan. I'm sure you're interested in this issue. Oh, well, um, yeah. You are quite busy, though, aren't you, Mum? That's right. (laughs) Yeah, I've got lunch to prepare. Today, in our second and final look at how politics has sneaked its way into the life of the archers, We'll be asking if the programme's portrayal of village politics is entirely realistic and how good a job it's done at reflecting our changing rural world. For many years, the actor Tim Bentink has played David Archer. Tim himself has a home in Norfolk. How does his own village compare with Ambridge? 
oh, I live in Ambridge. Yeah, absolutely, I won't tell you the name of the place. <laughs> but <laughs> the village in Norfolk is... I mean, what's so lovely about it is, and the reason why, why the arches works is because that would be true wherever I lived, whatever village I lived in, because of the archetypes, because the nature of a village is that each village has its Linda Snell, its Eddie Grundy, its gossipy shopkeeper, its patriarch, its big farmer, its family farmer, its organic farmer. All the characters in the arches are archetypes who are all represented in every village in the country. And to that extent, I think the Archers reflect village politics extremely accurately. Not everyone is so convinced. Stephen Coleman is a professor of politics at Leeds University, and he's made a study of the way soaps handle the world of politics. He's concluded that rather like the curate's egg, they do a better job in some areas than in others. Soaps are pretty good on the politics of everyday life. They're very reluctant to touch on live political issues, but they sometimes do. And when they do touch on the political process, the structures and the mechanisms and constitutional characteristics of politics, they're really not very good at all. There was a parish council election in the Archers about four years ago. And what I noticed in the way that that was taking place was a, a tendency towards caricature, a kind of Dickensian election with the most foolish people rising to the top and making the most noise. The proof's in front of you. Linda, I'm really sorry, but I haven't the Your faintest... Your campaign leaflet. Oh. Or should I say mine, since you've stolen almost all of my policies? Yours? Yes. Since when have you been running on a pro-street lighting agenda? <laughs> Give anyone ought to be against street lights. It should be you. Me? Yes. You're the one always going on about pollution. I mean, why aren't you agreeing with Nathan Booth? He wants to keep the skies dark so we can all gaze up at stars. A rather comic confrontation between the two candidates, Linda Snell and Lillian Bellamy. I suggested to the Archer's editor, Vanessa Whitburn, that the programme takes an almost flippant approach to village politics. You, you do have to make things entertaining. I would argue that we do see quite a lot of really serious political stories. For example, recently we've done a big village hall meeting on the issue of the, the Peregrine Falcons. Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this uh, special meeting regarding the proposed nesting platform on the church tower. Now, I'm a bit I'm of a bird over myself. I've got one of those so pole feeders in the back I garden, you know. Oh, yes. oh, it's just so lovely. PCC I can stand in the kitchen decision. doing the washing up and <laughs> watch the sparrows and chaffinches and the little blue tits picking up. We got some fun in Vicky's rather flaky attitude, but the issues were, were thoroughly debated within that scene. Now, this was connected to rural politics very strongly. The vicar was going to take it all back to the PCC and they were going to make a decision about whether there was going to be a platform on the church to support the Peregrine Falcon. If nesting falcons got Ambridge all a flutter, it was nothing compared to the countryside march through London in 2002, one of the biggest mass demonstrations of the past decade. If you like, we can get the banner up for a moment. Oh, would you mind? Let everyone know we're here, eh? Yeah, good idea. Caroline, uh, give me a hand, would you? More coaches from Brom. Look. I wonder if anybody left it. Oh, uh, there you are, Jennifer, look. Sorry. Oh, well oh. done. Sorry, I'm going. Well, don't worry, we've just got here ourselves. Really? Oh, you can leave your overnight bag on the coach. It was murder getting across London. Some kind of demonstration going on, apparently. <laughs> In common with hundreds of other villages, a coachload of protesters from Ambridge joined the countryside march to protest against the proposed ban on fox hunting and the decline of rural life. But nothing is ever straightforward in the Archers, not even a protest march. And for Brian Aldridge, it proved the perfect cover for a have-it-away day with his mistress, Siobhan. Well, there are many different types of rural pursuits, but for many, fox hunting is central to rural life. Hi, Daddy, how are you? Yeah, good, thanks, how are you? Yeah, really, really good, thank you, yeah. Hands looking good, you've just fed them, have you? Yeah, I've just fed the ones that have been hunting this morning, and then two more, three more lots to go, so we've got a fair, fair bit, another hour probably, before we get finished through this lot. <laughs> Deli Everard lives in a village in Gloucestershire where she helps run the Wessex branch of the Countryside Alliance. She's a lifelong Archers listener, but she's none too impressed by the way the programme deals with hunting. 
Hunting isn't reflected at all within Ambridge. If it is mentioned, then it's usually just on a Boxing Day meet. And those people who do go hunting are, in inverted commas, the posh people that go hunting. In reality, that's not the case at all. We come here to the kennels and people who would have been out this morning out hunting come from a wide cross-section of the community. And that is also what hunting's all about and that's what the march also reflected. I'd like to see a little bit more of hunting in Ambridge. It would be nice to see David and Ruth walking a puppy, for example, for the Borsetshire hunt. It would be nice for Will, the gamekeeper, to be talking to his local huntsman about which days the hounds are going to go through and what days he's shooting on, which is what happens in the countryside. The academic Stephen Coleman says producers and editors are often nervous of controversial topics like hunting. He argues that once they're introduced, they bring a cold blast of reality which can threaten the carefully crafted and cosy fabric of a drama serial's world. The absence of something like hunting in the archers is a perfect example of the reluctance, a slight embarrassment, the awkwardness that its producers feel about touching the really hot issues of contemporary politics. But Vanessa Whitburn, the programme's editor, doesn't accept this criticism. The important thing about it is we have characters across the village who represent different persuasions, whilst of course we have our pro-hunt characters and many of them, and so we should. Jill always has been anti-hunt over the years. We've had stories about hunting, we've had debates about hunting, we don't fill all our episodes with it. We've actually been on the hunt with characters. Hunting isn't the only subject over which the archers has felt pressure from campaigners. During the 1980s, some campaigners began to ask why Ambridge seemed to be entirely white, with not a sign of any ethnic minority. Liz Rigby edited the programme at the time. When I edited The Archers in the late 1980s, probably it wouldn't have been very realistic to have brought a black character in. It would have felt good, but it would have been sheer tokenism. When you introduce a black character in a situation like that, I can guarantee there would have been a number in real life of extremely racist comments about that black character. So what do you do if you're the editor? Do you actually reflect that realistically and have racist comments in your programme? Or do you have a nice piece of tokenism and all the people of Ambridge welcoming the black character and showing the nation how they should respond, the white nation, how it should respond to black faces? Or do you avoid the issue altogether because you can't bear to do either? And I'm afraid, as a pathetic wimp, I fell into that category. It wasn't until 1991 that the Asian solicitor, Usha Gupta, made her first appearance in the village. Darling, this is Usha. Usha Gupta. Shula, how lovely to meet you. It's uh, nice to meet you too. Trevor Phillips is the head of the Equality and Human Rights Commission. He's also a devoted Archers listener. This is how he saw it. Usha seemed like a slightly exotic and odd character for the first few months. But actually, in the real world, it wasn't odd for somebody in roughly the Midlands area who was Asian to move into an area, especially given her job as a lawyer and so on. Where are you from, Usha? Sorry? I mean, where's the family home? London. Oh, yes, right. I've always been in London. I did my articles at the GLC. They had this really rather brilliant stroke of making the big thing about Usha. How would her family react to the various things she was doing that might not have been thought to be right for an Asian girl? And actually, for non-Asian listeners, or people who don't know much about the Asian culture... That actually was rather a good way to encounter that because it really became an issue that you could understand in family terms. It was Vanessa Whitburn who introduced the character and she says she had no intention of trying to duck the issue of racism. We have actually, with the story of Usha when she first came in, we've shown it in a very tough way. I mean, she had excrement chucked through her letterbox. I mean, you know, that's a pretty tough story. And Roy, of course, was part of a racist gang in his youth. We then, over time, showed how he came to see how horrific this was by being able to empathise a bit with Usha. And although we had a very strong scene of apology between them, the two are not hugely comfortable in each other's company and never will be. 
Two months ago, you saw me as an object of contempt, and now you say you're sorry. You want me to go on living in Ambridge. So what's changed, huh? Nothing. Well, come on. I want to know. What's different about me? Is it my clothes? What? My face, the colour of my skin? I'm just sorry, OK? Oh, well, sorry for what exactly? What happened? I mean, I should never have got mixed up with it. So why did you? And did you handle it that way because that's how you thought that rural society was changing or because that's how you wanted it to be? I think it is because we thought that's how rural society was changing, gently. Yes, you get racism, but you don't get very often people standing on the street yelling and screaming in rural society. There is racism. Racism will never go away. It can be directed towards all kinds of communities. But there is more understanding, there is more enlightenment, and there is more. There are more black and Asian and minority people living in villages. But as much as Vanessa Whitburn says she tried to deal with the issues of racism in a measured and dignified manner, former editor Liz Rigby says she found that anything the Archers did, even the smallest and seemingly most innocent of acts, was bound to upset someone. You literally couldn't have somebody cutting their finger and Jill cutting off a piece of elastoplast without getting a flurry of letters from district nurses saying, we don't cut elastoplast. I mean, that's ridiculous. I mean, she should have torn a piece of a, a, a Band-Aid off in a proper sterile fashion. And similarly, I do remember having Nelson Gabriel smoking in the vicinity of his very elderly father, Walter Gabriel, and the doctor said, no, look, don't smoke in the same room as him. You know, it's not good for him to breathe in that smoke. And the tobacco lobby, with one voice, leapt on top of me. Passive smoking wasn't proven at that time, and I shouldn't have broadcast that it's unhealthy to smoke around a 90-year-old person with a chest condition. I did stand up to them. I wasn't quite such a wimp then. <laughs> It's not only pressure groups which keep such a close eye on events in Ambridge. Party politicians are often keen to get in on the act, laying claim to a storyline, even a character, when they think it'll help make a point. The countryside must be made safer. We've already announced tough proposals to deal with New Age travellers and ravers. These people have even made it on to the archers. And no, Geoffrey, I don't at this point mean you. Well, I've got some good news for Ambridge. When our new laws are in place, Eddie Grundy won't need to spray manure on his fields to get rid of them. Michael Howard there, harvesting the applause at the Conservative Party conference in 1993. But he didn't have it all his own way. Labour's Neil Kinnock also had a thing or two to say about Eddie Grundy, as his wife, Glenys, an Archer's fan of many years, recalls. At some point, Neil said it ought to be called um, the Grundys versus their oppressors. And I think that that's how he sees it. At one point, Neil was a member of the Eddie Grundy fan club. I don't know if it still exists, but he thought that he was really the hero because he was always fighting back against the posh snobs in the village. <laughs> what? Eddie Grundy, an oppressed minority? I asked the actor who plays him, Trevor Harrison. As a Grundy. As a Grundy. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, in the, in the early days of playing Eddie, there was a lot of that. There was a lot of, oh, the archers are always doing this and the archers are always doing that. It, it's quite fun. I mean, there obviously is a history before, obviously, I joined the programme, perhaps even before the, the programme of well, Grundy versus uh, the archers. And to a certain extent, it lives on sometimes through uh, Joe Grundy, Eddie's dad. Uh, occasionally comes up, well, you know, the archers and blah, blah, blah. But it, it's not so much these days. Uh, but as a family, I think that see, over the years... They've struggled, really. They have had some um, tragic moments, obviously, but they have survived. The Grundys have been a bellwether for much of the social change that's overtaken the British countryside, and it hasn't always been comfortable. Their lowest ebb came when they were evicted from Grange Farm and had to leave Ambridge altogether. Three generations of Grundys crammed into a tiny council flat on a rundown estate in Borchester. And they were threatened with eviction once again when the new landlords discovered that Eddie had brought with him three ferrets from the farm. But for Eddie, they weren't just ferrets. They were the last remaining threads of his dignity. I've drawn a line in the sand! Hey, hey where are they, Eddie? Not over three blooming ferrets! Tell him, Joe! Oh, don't ask me. It's not the ferrets! It's the... Yes! Yes! I know! 
But can't you get it into your thick skull? Your precious principal is going to cost you your family. It's either them ferrets or me. In the end, it was Eddie's father, Joe, who resolved matters in a drastic and desperate fashion by beating the ferrets to death with a hammer. What? I, what did you do it? For Clary. You what? Tearing poor Clary apart, it was. The thought of losing the roof over her head. It weren't their fault. Not much of a roof we grant you. What, the ferrets' fault? They hadn't been on the street. They didn't do nothing. Any room. It's all over now. How could you? I got it sorted for you. My beautiful ferrets. You can stay here. Not like that. I ain't going to throw you out now. You didn't have to kill him, Dad. You didn't have to kill him. Powerful stuff. Here's Trevor Harrison once again. Through tragedy, through drama, the Grundys have developed, or Eddie's developed, and uh, become far more whole. And so looking back on the sort of losing the farm and becoming bankrupt and all that, there were sad stories which happened to people in real life. But to a certain extent, like real life, it's made people a little bit more solid and they got through it somehow. The Grundys haven't survived all of the dangers and their escapades. There seemed to be a family on the way up. Now, and, and the great thing about the Grundys is that they are, no matter what they go through, they are a family. Do you see them in the years to come as being a more influential family in Ambridge? I can't see Joe and Eddie being influential in Ambridge. I don't know, perhaps people in years to come might come for advice. I mean, Joe's a fountain of knowledge in his way. I can't see them being influential. I mean, they'll never be Aldridge's <laughs> in that respect, no. Well, except, of course, barriers do break down, and they are breaking down in the, in, in, in the countryside of Ambridge. I mean, Chris Carter, for instance, marrying Alice Aldridge. I mean, the boundaries are beginning to move, and, and the, the hard divisions between the different classes in Ambridge are beginning to break down. Yes, they are. The class thing, you know, I mean, one time, you know, I know, you know, Eddie calls Brian, Brian, you know, at one point, many years, he was always Mr Aldridge, I wouldn't think twice of doing it. So, yeah, I mean, things have changed, but there's still that countryside tradition. I mean, there's still the shoot, there's still the shooters and the beaters, and that will always be, because that is a countryside traditional pursuit. Class barriers may be on the wane, ferrets may no longer be the pets of choice, but in certain quarters of the village, snobbery is still flourishing. Just ask the wealthy landowning Aldridges. When they threw a party for their daughter Alice to mark her marriage to Chris Carter, a close cousin of Ambridge's very own underclass, the Horobins, all the snobbishness and class contempt burst forth. Mm. This food really is to die for. Yeah. At the rate the Horobins are wolfing it down, I just hope there's enough to go round. Oh, come on, Mum, you've hardly touched a thing. Well... Reading certainly isn't one of the Horobin's skills. They've totally ignored my table plan. Ah, oh, but it's better like this, though, don't you think? I agree. Sprinkling of Horobin's throughout is far better than having them herded all together at one end. I mean, this way, their effect is diluted. That wasn't what I meant, and you know it. It seems like this that still annoy another Archer's fan, the former Labour cabinet minister, David Blunkett. The people who are depicted as being real strugglers in terms of their income they're often depicted as being a bit thick and a little bit out of it and a little bit silly and i think even recently with all the politically conscious ways in which the archers are now dealing with things you have the put downs over people not knowing which knife and fork to use or getting the wrong idea about a particular soup and that irritates me a little because I think that's patronising. So the archers? Patronising? I put that point to the programme's editor, Vanessa Whitburn. Certainly there is some snobbery in Ambridge and we get both entertainment and interest out of that, social interest. What I think is really interesting now is that both the Alice and Chris, who've joined the Carters and the Aldridges together, have captured some kind of zeitgeist. They're very popular characters and I think it is because... They just refuse to acknowledge this snobbishness and they just steamroller over it completely. And I think people quite like that. It's a breath of fresh air. So the writers have grabbed this, the actors have grabbed this, and it does show shifts in society. I think, you know, to be a snob is amusing and boring nowadays. And I think people like characters that simply refuse to debate it. They just ignore it. 
But if the Archers can sometimes exasperate its politically-minded fans, at other times it can leave them full of admiration. Trevor Phillips says that for him, one long-running story has had a particular resonance. The biggest single social change that's taking place in this country, and indeed in Europe overall, is the ageing of the population. In the next couple of decades, the number of people over 85 will double, the population as a whole will get much older, and with it will come the conditions of age, including conditions like Alzheimer's. So the story arc which involves Jack Woolley and his dementia has been extraordinarily timely and telling and significant. The character of Peggy Woolley is played by June Spencer, who in real life nursed her own husband, Roger, through dementia. She agrees with Trevor Phillips that the Archers has done immensely valuable work in helping raise public awareness of the condition. Well, I thought it was an excellent idea because not so very long ago, it wasn't talked about. It didn't get much publicity. It was a subject that you didn't talk about if you had a relative who had Alzheimer's. And I thought that it was an excellent thing to bring it out into the open. And also, what happened to the carers? Very difficult job being a carer of someone with Alzheimer's. The really touching thing that stuck in my mind about this was the moment in... I recognise this because my own stepfather died after four years with Alzheimer's, most of which he was bedridden, was when Peggy went to visit Jack. She came out and she was obviously distressed and I can't remember who she was talking to, but anyway, the conversation, the person was trying to get out of her, what was going on? What's the matter? There's obviously something wrong. Lillian. Will you just tell me? Yep. It's nothing, really. It's just Jack. I thought so. I went to find him in the lounge and he was sitting in a chair next to Violet. Yeah? Ted's wife. I know, I know. And... Oh, what, Mum? Come on, what on earth's happened? And they were holding hands, Lillian. Jack and Violet. And I know I'm being silly and I know it doesn't mean anything, but every time I tried to distract him, he just wanted to wander off with her. Oh, I couldn't separate them. Oh, I'm sorry. That must have been horrible. She said he was holding Violet's hand. And you could sort of feel the incredible pain, in spite of the fact that she knew that this meant nothing. I thought that they dealt with that really, really well in taking a huge, big political issue, but actually reducing it to a small, understandable moment but one that allows you to grasp why this is so important and beyond politics. Which seems to have brought us almost full circle. In the 50s, the Archer spent much of its time trying to exhort farmers to modernise, mechanise, produce more food. So to what extent is it still trying to give a lead on issues like dementia? A question I put to Vanessa Whitburn. The Archers can't set an agenda on its own. What happens is you start something because you think it's relevant to the characters you've got but it's also a subject which is of interest to your listeners. There is a point at which the sheer popularity of the programme and the fact that it is on six days a week and the fact that the press are interested in your cast, in our case June Spencer whose own husband had Alzheimer's and she cared for him does mean that there are points at which you lead the debate as well. And I think that's fine. So you both follow and you lead. Trevor Phillips believes it's the programme's reflective qualities that have sustained the Archers over its extraordinary 60-year run, longer than any other soap in the world. They help to tell us what our national story is in a way that, you know, none of us individu as individuals can see. When a series stops doing that, we stop watching it. Who remembers El Dorado? You know, who cared? That wasn't telling us anything about ourselves. But The Archers has consistently, with all its ups and downs, managed to reflect a true and pretty faithful picture of England particularly, but I think Britain more widely. And for that, you know, anybody who has any sensibility or cares at all about the society we live in has to be grateful because it's holding up the mirror to us and sometimes... We need to look at ourselves as a country and as a society and see what we're really like. So, what next for the village? As we heard at the start of the programme, Tim Bentink, the voice of David Archer, 
believes Ambridge already has all the rural archetypes, except perhaps for one. Well, the only person that we're missing, of course, is the pop star who should be there because, um, you know, great wealth from great bands. I mean, you know, we ought to have Jimmy Page living around the corner. It would be great. The enormously wealthy pop star who are, you know, in many ways, the, the, the new custodians of the land because they've got so much money and they don't have to worry about, you know, death duties and lead on the roof and things. They have enormous wealth and enormous land and they farm and they hunt and they shoot and they've become, you know, they are the new aristocracy in that sense. Tim Bentinck there, along with the guitarist Robert Percy's whimsical take on the Archer's signature tune, Barwick Green. Well, Madonna and Sting have country estates just down the road from my little village, so I guess Tim is right. But I suppose in a programme like this we have to give the last word not to a pop star, but to a politician. David Blunkett has an idea for a new Archer's character, himself. Oh, I'd like to be in the Arches. I'd like to be invited along to speak in the village hall and talk about politics and to get a real debate going and people being really disgruntled that somebody like me had been invited to actually make a political address as opposed to opening the local fate. And if he ever gets that invitation, then I, for one, would be happy to join him in the village hall. I might just be the one at the back heckling. Will that happen? You never know, not in Ambridge. That's what's kept us listening these 60 years, and long may it remain so. Goodbye.